become a, a really good friend. Um, but one of the things that I enjoy the most about working and presenting with Kelly is that she is a lifelong learner um, and she encourages others to do that. And I think when you see her present, you'll see um, the depth of the knowledge that she carries into data visualization and data analysis, um, but also just the passion that she puts into her work. Um, but now more about, about you all and what we're hoping to do today. So our, um, our goal for today is to make DEI discussions doable or more doable for you. Um, we have a couple of outcomes just to give you a sense of what we hope you take away. Um, we hope that you learn more about how to utilize the North Carolina Community College dashboards or any dashboard really to prepare effective data visualizations. Um, we hope that we can help you formulate a DEI campus question that compels you and then that you can describe three active meeting techniques and a good use for, for each one of those. Before I hand it over to Kelly, I think um, as I've held a lot of discussions and actually studied um, leading discussions for learning, there's been two lessons that I've learned and that have been challenging for me to put into practice in terms of holding discussions. Um, one of them is about this pause idea. We have to get used to allowing for awkward pauses. That silence that happens in a discussion I have found if you can leave it long, linger longer than feels comfortable to you, oftentimes something really important happens after that. So people are processing it different amounts of time. Some people are holding back. Um, and if you can let it hang, I know sometimes it makes you feel like people don't know what you're doing, but you know what you're doing. And then the second one is, is that my tendency is to try to wrap a discussion up really neatly um, at the end. And I found it's best for me to hand a discussion at the end off to a partner um, who can let it end in more of an open way because that allows for discussions to continue. If you wrap it up too well, um, it may not continue beyond your presentation. So I'm gonna hand it to Kelly just to do a little warm up exercise for you. I hope that you'll participate and we'll allow for long pauses if you need time. Kelly. Good morning, everyone. Uh, one advantage I think I have over Anne is before I came into higher education, I was a high school science teacher. So I got very comfortable with just standing there waiting for someone to be willing to volunteer a guess at an answer. So those awkward pauses, I'm, I think I'm more used to them than Anne is. But I hope Anne hasn't raised your expectations of my part of the presentation too high. But what we would like to know is what you would like to see out of this presentation. What are your expectations and what do you hope are the takeaways that we will give to you? So we would really appreciate it if you would take a moment and just in the chat, give us an idea of what brought you today, what interests you about this topic and what you're hoping to learn. And so we're going to do that awkward pause for a moment, give everyone a chance to pull their thoughts together and just a few words doesn't have to be really expansive, but we would like to know what you hope to get from us today. Okay, so I see that people, several people are hoping to get some ideas for resources, some ideas for metrics and pitfalls that you might accidentally fall into and how best to avoid them. Grounding or anchoring uncomfortable discussions. And yes, DEI discussions can end up being very uncomfortable because it makes us be reflective and consider our assumptions and what we take for granted that might not be the same for everyone else. Deciding which data points to look at and what level to display them. 
So there's a lot of interest, I think, Anne, in what we're going to be talking about today. Hopefully, we're going to be able to provide answers to a lot of these questions, or at least to provide some resources to help everyone get started on data visualization and leading these difficult discussions. This is right up my alley. I feel like the universe is saying, okay, Susan, this is what you want to do. Let's go. Bye. Hmm. Educating through data. Oh, I love that phrase. Educating through data. So, Anne, I think, I think it's time for me to turn it back over to you so you can talk about compelling questions. Well, if you want to skip ahead, we did have you up for this part next. Oh, that's fine. I can go ahead and do that. See, this is, this is why Anna and I are a good combo. She keeps me on track <laughs> and I make her relax a little bit because <laughs> as you will see, she goes way into her slides and mine are much more basic. So real quickly, I'm sure most of us have encountered at least one person we could qualify as a data dreader. And this is someone who, whether we wanna say they're scared of data or they don't like data or they're just uncomfortable with data, you know, well, where does this idea of being a data dreader come from? Well, hi, and back a couple of years ago, you know, the pre-COVID era, did some research and found it came down to really three different, um, three different sources. You know, data dreaders may not understand where the data comes from. What's the source of the data? How, how did this data even appear? They have trouble translating the data into a real world context. You know, what does this data actually mean to me in a way I understand it? Or they're like, well, this is great. These are numbers, whatever, qualitative, quantitative, but what do I do with it? They don't see how the data can help them take actions. So for them, the idea of a data informed decision based on their previous experience may just not make sense because they haven't encountered data that was presented in a way to help them take actions. So if we move on to the next slide. How do we turn a data dreader into a data user? Well, there's no simple one step solution, but a really important step in this evolution is guess what? And you can probably guess effective data presentation. And I do want to take a moment to say this is a DEI conversation. And um, I will admit that when I went looking for cute little cartoons and stuff, unfortunately, you're going to see a lot of majority representations. And so I apologize in advance for not having a truly diverse representation in some of the little cartoon pictures and stuff. But I do wanna recognize that we are actually an incredibly diverse group of people in those of us in the data world. And also we work with an incredibly diverse group of people and it would be best to be able to represent that diversity. And we do try, but occasionally it's just difficult to find the cute little pictures that we wanna put on our slides that represent the variety of people in our world. So having made that little statement to acknowledge the lack of diversity in some of my slides, let's move on to the next one. So why is it important to acknowledge data dreaders? Well, it's actually beneficial, not just for the data dreaders, but for you. Because when you think about how to help the data dreaders, it makes your own presentation stronger because it encourages you to really think about the flow, the takeaways, 
to really think about the outline you want to follow, the visualizations you want to use, how you can help the audience make connections. So for instance, I love the, the little house figure I created. So if you're talking about a statistic, 25% of small businesses make it through their first five years. Okay, at the same time you're talking about that, a really easy thing to do is just have a little cartoon that sort of translates the 25% into the one of four fraction. So you're presenting the data in a couple of different ways, helping the audience make connections for those that might not be as comfortable with even something that we would consider everyday percentages. So by helping the audience utilize the data more effectively, this benefits the organization in terms of decision-making, in terms of improving data literacy, and hopefully improving the bottom line, whether that's improving profits or for us in higher education, improving student outcomes. So a lot of this I'm hoping is going to be reviewed but just to make sure we're all sort of thinking about the way our brains encapsulate data. In, yes, PowerPoint and all our data visualization, excuse me, data visualization tools tend to come with standard templates. We don't have to stick to them. And so there's a lot of good resources out there. One of the last slides in my section is gonna give you some of those resources. But for right now, let's just pull out some easy stuff to utilize and remember. Headline titles. So it's not just student success over five years. Think about you know, student success has improved over five years or success of underrepresented students has improved by 20% over <coughs> 10 years. And these are completely made up numbers, but help writing the headline to really help the audience move to the takeaway. If you have a graph and there's, they can be cluttered, Add a call out, add an annotation that points to the key takeaway from that chart. And one thing, we can do so many fancy things. We can do, oh, I'm going to, Sansky diagrams. Sansky diagrams can be wonderful things. They can also be a hot mess. So just remember our brains do better in two dimensions than three that we do better with length rather than angles. Pie charts can be really good if you only have two, maybe three categories. But the more categories you have, the more difficult it is for our brains in general to interpret the pie chart. So we just, as a species, our brains work better with length than we do with angles. Another really simple thing we can do is to pick a scheme and stick with it. We recently presented a five-year enrollment report to our VP of Student Affairs. And we were talking about curriculum, continuing ed, and basic skills students. Each group of students had a specific color. Curriculum students were gold, seat, uh, continuing ed students were blue, and then basic skills students were I have completely forgotten what color they were. We'll just say they were orange. But in any event, so whenever we were presenting a visualization about one of those groups, we had a specific color. We had consistency in how we were presenting our graphs so that if you looked at one graph and then another, there, was, there wasn't a disconnect between the way we were labeling axes or anything like that. And simplicity is better as, you know, sans serif, sans, and personally, I always get those two mixed up, but, you know, knowing which type of font is easier for an audience to read. 
And then the big pitfall a lot of us fall into, and it's not intentional, we have to think about accessibility, not just in terms of what happens when I take this very colorful PowerPoint and print it in black and white to save money, but what about members of the audience who have different forms of neurodiversity and their brain interprets the visual data in multiple ways. So on the bottom right hand side of the screen, you can see um, a picture of colored balloons on the left and then how three different brains can interpret it based on how they interpret color, the various forms of color blindness. So it's important to think about using texture using dashes instead of lines for everything to just help make your, your data more accessible. And then moving on, this sort of encapsulates everything all together. So if we as data presenters plan ahead, know our audience, help them create the connection and see the relevancy by optimizing our visuals, then data dreaders who wonder where the data came from, not sure how to interpret it, not real comfortable with using data to drive decisions, can take the steps forward to becoming a data user who wants to use data, who gets how data can help. And then in that process, we're benefiting our students and our organizations. And there are lots of good books out there to help you with data visualization. We are focusing on sort of an equity lens on data. So the resources that I'm gonna provide you on this next slide are really focused on visualization through an equity lens. And so Anne and I, oops, I think we skipped two slides. No, we didn't. This is my fault. I apologize. Yes, my caffeine has not kicked in. We wanted to highlight the North Carolina Community College System dashboards because they offer lots and lots of data for us. So this, we've included the link. And then these are just snapshots of drilling down into the various dashboards. And so we're going to take a closer look at the success rate in college level English. And just to point out that this is a dashboard, lots of good information here. And when you only have two categories, male and female, it's fairly easy to interpret the data because you can see the female line is higher than the male line, no offense. Um, is so that females are having a higher level of success. But what if we move from looking at a two category to a uh, one, two, three, four, five, to an eight category variable? Lots of color, which is great. We can see that the, I think it's the Asian line is the top line and I think that the black line is the bottom line, but in between, there's a lot of jumble. And that's not a factor of this being a bad dashboard, because it's not. It's a good dashboard. It's just trying to present a lot of information. So is there a way that we can take the information from the dashboard and reframe it to help our audience really think about what this what this data can tell us. Kelly, can I interject one minute? Sure, go right ahead. Um, I just wanted, you and I have had a lot of discussions based on the book, Equity Talk to Equity Walk. And I think one of the things that stood out to me and we've talked about with that is when you're presenting this kind of data, how important it is when you put your first slide up to show all of the groups and to take the time to name each one of the groups because it's very important, each, even if some groups are very small in people, it's important to recognize that those are people and a part of this data set. Um, but then when you move on to a visual that you're trying to get action off of, 
it's perfectly okay after you've introduced that to then narrow down to maybe the top three groups or the one group that you're most interested in. But I do think it's good practice in terms of diversity and equity to always start maybe with a messy slide, but to acknowledge every group and then to narrow it down for the simplicity of the visual. And that brings up another good point because I agree with Anne, you have to acknowledge all the various backgrounds of our students. And sometimes what we do as data oriented professionals, we want to take the smallest groups that we would have to suppress and combine them into um, to create a larger group that maybe we want to call other or just generally underrepresented minorities. And that can be beneficial, but we have to be very careful to acknowledge that within this larger group, not all of those students are gonna have the same experiences. And then I think the other important thing for us to acknowledge is that we're looking at groups as a whole and that, that we're not looking at individual student experiences and to, to realize that what I as a white Anglo-Saxon Southern female experiences is maybe not the same as other females in my group. And so, Anne, that's a great point. We're actually going to continue to just look at all of the groups because the visualizations we're going to look at have a slightly different point. So what if we use the data from that slide as a starting point? And so what I did is I took their bar graph and just turned it into a table. And then I created an extra variable called success goal. I just created this. This is not official. This is not state of North Carolina expectation benchmark, but wouldn't it be great if we could get all of our students to a success goal? So let's take a look at a first visualization. Kelly, let me interject with a question because I think it's timely to the point we just we just talked about. Um, so there's a question, is there a data governance group that sets the standards definition so everyone is speaking the same language when presenting data to other to others? And I think, yes, I know in, in my department, um, we made within my area made an agreement to use a field and colleague called iPads race. Um, and we can rename some of the categories if they're not um, the, the most current language that the federal government has, we can change the language. But in terms of the output, um, I have standardized to the iPads race groups um, and use that every time I disaggregate out. Um, and as I move into conversations with IT about building out dashboards, I was just talking with them last week. Um, we have a dashboard user group and to start to put in exactly what field we're using and what names we're using for groups as we build out communication tools. So yes, and I think the one that makes the most sense to everybody is to start with, with this particular demographic group. Um, and don't be afraid to, to name things the way you want them to be and pick the field that you want. Again, I recommend iPads Race and Colleague, um, but it can be a point of good discussion and you can revise later. Um, but I think instead of hesitating and trying to get a lot of um, consensus on the front side, I'd encourage you to do what you know is best current practice um, and, and move on from there. I will say, I don't think at the system level, and if I'm wrong, I apologize and someone let us know. I don't think we have an overall standard that we're using in North Carolina. And that would be beneficial, I think, because we're also at the point now where we're comparing, we're doing peer comparisons. And you wanna make sure that both groups are calling apples apples. And so it's all, this brings up the good point, like Ann just said, you know, identify somewhere, whether it's at the bottom of the visualization, if it's on a separate page, if we're talking about a dashboard, you know, what is the source of the data? 
how, you know, what are the names associated? And then this actually brings up an, another good point. So you'll notice on the system dashboard that they have listed the groups in alphabetical order. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if you aren't using something sort of standardized like alphabetical order, you also need to think about the fact that the groups you list first, are they the standard against which all the other groups are being compared? So you really have to take the time to try and look at your visualization from the perspective of someone that doesn't know what they're looking at initially. You know, what are they going to think first when they see your graph or your chart or whatever your visualization is? And it's really helpful when you're creating visualizations to pull in the users and get their input and on um, what works for them, what they what makes sense. And are we good, Anne? Can we go take a look at it? Okay. <laughs> when you like do it live. So this is what I've seen as a common method of just displaying success data. And again, this doesn't have a great title. That's partly because I did it in Excel and there's a limit on how long your title can be. So I apologize for that. But when you look at this chart, what are some of the first things that you notice? And chat. What, so as you look at this, what are the first thoughts or first questions that pop in your head when you see this chart? Kelly, it's a little hard to focus and to know what you're trying to say with that chart. Yeah, it's just sort of there. You're like, well, I see that the Asian group is at 61%. And the group labeled black is at 27%, but yeah, success, success of what? And I will just be honest, you're not going to see a change in the title. There's a lot of white space. It's open for interpretation. So what if we just add something? What if we add a line showing the average, in this case, for North Carolina? Does this lead you in any, any particular direction? How do your thoughts change when you look at this? I, I know one of the first things I noticed is which groups are above the line and which groups are below the line. And I also noticed that the average is 45% which doesn't sound very high, okay? Easier to comprehend because we've added sort of a, a comparison standard. It's not just here's the data, it's sort of helping you interpret, okay? What if we add one more piece of information? Yes, Susan, that's exactly where I was headed. When we throw in the success goal, now as we look at this chart, what, what does it tell us about our students? And remember, I completely made up the success goal. But what does having the, the groups, the average, and the success goal, what does that tell us about our students? You know, in working with these kinds of slides with groups, one of the things that I've appreciated about a success goal um, is that it shows everybody needs to improve, that there's not this hyper focus on one particular group that might feel other, might make people feel like they don't want to join the conversation. Our interventions are to get everybody to the same level of success. And this shows really clearly the disparities and the gaps. So maybe if we can focus on efforts for the lowest group, how is that going to raise the results for everybody? Um, but I think the fact that the success goal is set above the highest for all the groups um, is, is a smart choice. And that actually brings up a good point because we really do want to focus on the success for all the groups. 
And if we don't have a state of success goal, there seems to be just sort of human nature to fall back with what's, well, what's the easy choice? Well, let's bring them all up to match the highest group. And so you, so it's really easy to fall into that comparison of, well, how are Hispanic students doing in comparison to students who report being of two or more races? And really, we really want to keep the focus on what is, what do we consider success for our students, no matter their background? And I think it's really important to keep focus on that goal for all students while trying to identify the supports that are going to help student, all students reach those goals. Hey Kelly, I think I would, I would maybe just add, hopefully not to belabor the point, but what that does, and I even use the word opportunity gap instead of equity gap, because I feel like that's a positive action. But again, if we're talking about the opportunity gap between black and white students, in the way that we're presenting the data, we're pitting two groups against each other. And that's absolutely not what we're trying to do. So setting that success goal above and for everybody, um, I think is a rhetorical choice and, and a good one. Okay, and Susan says, she, um, you know, additional disaggregation in terms of English proficiency, socioeconomic status, first generation. Yes, these are, there's all, it's really good to disaggregate in multiple ways so that you're trying to avoid the stereotypes. Like there is a stereotype that Asians are good at math and science. And to sort of go back to something Anne said at the beginning, it's important to acknowledge all the student groups but it can be overwhelming depending on how many different categories of students you have at your institution. Sometimes it's easier as a starting point to focus on maybe the largest groups. And so on the next slide, which Anne saw in a presentation by the Institute for Evidence-Based Change, they've done a really nice job of pointing out the humans behind the numbers. And so they've used pictures in addition to numbers and visual placement. So you may not even notice it initially, but the placement of the pictures actually is related to the success rate. And, and I think so this, oh, and I'm it also sorry. no, I, I also reinforces the point earlier that you made about your your headline that your title is almost like a headline telling people the story that you're trying to share and show. So it, it also links back to what you were saying earlier. Yeah, this is a nice visual. And it's an important, we sometimes tend to get, and I'm as guilty of this as anyone else, I'm a numbers person. And so I look at numbers and I have no problems. It's good to be able to pet some pictures with numbers and it can help other people that aren't as comfortable with numbers not only see the people behind the numbers, but just make that connection. Yeah, linking back to your, your data dreader group and, and getting into audience. You know, if you're with a broad audience and everybody, then you, you present at a high level. And if you're going into a committee level, um, you might use this to introduce, but then you're gonna show more complicated visuals from there. Okay, and so this is the slide I was referring to uh, a bit earlier. And yes, Anna and I are both huge fans of Equity Talk to Equity Walk. And then these are two other toolkits that really look about at using or applying equity lens to data visualization. And they're all, well, the toolkit and the Do No Harm Guide are free. Equity Talk to Equity Walk, I wish was free because I think everyone should have a copy of it on their bookshelf. But, um, and I really shouldn't be, you know, promoting, but I love the book. So I highly recommend it. And, and I think it is time for me to turn it over to you to talk about creating some compelling questions. Yeah, 
I think the, the presentation we had set up at the beginning about effective visualizations and then moving into discussion techniques with, with your visualizations. So we're gonna make that transition now, but before we do, let's do that pause. Um, and if there's things that you want um, to just get clarification on, or if it's kind of created a question for you, um, please use this as a space to put into the chat anything that you'd like us to kind of clarify before we move on into the, the part about discussion techniques. And, and I think this is also a good time to go ahead and upload the handout I created that it's got some copies of the slides. It's also got some additional notes. It's a one page handout and I hope it's something you find useful. And it does also include these resources. I'll have to put it in later. I can't, I can't locate it. I had it there. Honestly, okay. Okay. I can put it in no, while you're talking. No, Don't worry about no, it. No, I found it. Okay. Um, I will say that you notice I was not, I was focusing on really simple data visualizations. And dashboards are wonderful things, but even the best designed dashboards can be overwhelming for people that aren't comfortable with data. And so, I think it's a really good idea when you're presenting data to a broad audience to start simple and then get complicated or to start with one visualization and then work them up to a dashboard where you might have a couple of different visualizations on the same page. Kelly, I'm sorry. I'll I'm do it. Don't worry I'm about it. Super data dense. I'm so I mean presentation dense. That's my fault though. Just just go back to the presentation. That's no problem. I can upload it while while you're talking. Good. And then I close the chat. So just make sure, Ken, you can make sure if we're cutting anybody's idea off too soon. Good. Good. Looks like we're ready to move ahead then. All right. Um, so getting the right visual is important, but having the conversation to move to sense making and decision making um, is really the end goal. And so for um, me and the conversations that I've had over the past year on campus about um, strategic planning and about equity and inclusion, um, I feel like there's a few attitudes to foster um, that you can support and that you can encourage your leadership to support but equal access to data, reports that your office puts out, reports um, for dashboards, making sure that everybody has access to that, that there's a sense of data democracy, that if you're gonna put out and get people's interest in things, they should have the ability to go deeper and that shouldn't just be restricted to a certain group of people. I think for sense-making, for the kinds of discussions that you wanna have, it's important to build those groups cross-functionally there's a lot of value of cross-pollinating for these kinds of discussions and letting those people, when you dig deep into the data, pick out the facts that are most relevant because they're the boots on the ground. Um, and then a culture to experiment as much as we can, um, being willing to say that didn't go the way I planned, um, being, being willing to say, well, we may have failed at this in the past, but now's an opportunity to learn from that and to go again forward in a different direction. Um, so that growth mindset those are the kinds of things that you really wanna foster. Um, but I think the part that's been important to me um, as I've led these discussions over the past year on my campus um, is that I really needed, because it's not always easy, um, I really needed to have a question that was personally compelling, that was compelling me to think about how to present the data and compelling me to lead people to the kinds of conclusions necessary. So. I think Kelly's presentation, in a sense, taking you out to the complexity of those dashboards was really an encouragement for you to do the work, to dig very deeply and to find in that complicated data, uncover a compelling question to you, and then start your discussion based on visualizations that help tell that story. Um, and so I think uh, the, the, the point for me, and I'll, I'll go on a little bit further, but let me just share this next slide and it's related to Kelly's resources. Um, this is what's inspiring me to lead right now. Um, these are the resources, Equity Talk to Equity Walk, um, John Lewis's last book, 
um, across that bridge. It is a good reflection. It's in audio, um, good for people who are interested in social change. The activities that I'm going to talk you through today almost all come from this discussion book, and I follow Stephen Brookfield pretty closely. Um, there's a singer-songwriter. Um, he wrote a song called God Believes in You. It's, it's um, interfaith, really, but there's a period of my life where I listen to that song every day, especially through hard times. And then recently, I've discovered the group um, Black Violin, and this album in particular is the kind of thing that encourages you to, you to keep these kind of conversations going. So let me tell you about um, my compelling question. What um, this is the this is the summary of it after the discussions. But what I noticed coming in here and from my previous institution was when I looked at the demographic breakout in multiple ways of our first time students. I noticed that there was greater diversity and a diversity that reflected our community better in our first time student cohort than there was in our retention rates, than there was in our graduation rates. The um, differences were profound in um, blockout, stopout rates, and in academic warning rates. And so, you know, what, what's happening? There's a group of students coming with an aspiration that seems to reflect our community, but then as they move through our programs and our services, it changes a great deal and something was wrong. And that was a simple story to compel. I shared it as I talked with people. I shared it as we had our conversations. So what ended up being the story, the need statement that we carried into our conversations was, yes, we have high student satisfaction rates, but those same students with high rates are also having low student success. So what is going on that our first time student enrollment looks so different than the progression through the life cycle? And that was a broad enough question to keep me going into other areas. Um, and I think there's lots of questions to find. But again, root yourself in what you know um, is going to keep you going in a conversation. Um, Kelly, I'm going to switch over to this one for you just to talk about how this has been an inspiration for you. OK, and I will say that I've put two links in the chat. Um, I'm still trying to get the our PDF to upload. So worst case scenario, we will remind everyone of our emails at the end. And we will also try and get all the PDFs to Ken and maybe he can work with the conference organizers to get them out to all the participants. So a few weeks ago, I was on Instagram and I saw this quote by Desmond Tutu and it just really spoke to me because I think it really speaks to the importance of figuring out why stuff is happening, figuring out what the barriers are, or in this case, or in this case, why people keep falling into the river. And it's not just enough to identify the symptoms. You really need to dig deeper and understand what's happening. And that can mean looking deeply into yourself, into what, you do, what you're doing in your classroom, or the assumptions that you're bringing to your work that you just don't even question because you don't even really consciously think about them. The idea of implicit bias, if you haven't explored the Harvard project on implicit bias, I encourage you to do that. And I'll throw the link for that in the chat too when I go back off camera here so that you can't see me frantically searching to find it. But we are working on uploading our handouts for you and I will continue to put in links as we go along. And I saw the comment in the chat and since we're not able to put our handouts in the way we thought to, I just wanted to pull this up. I, I got that other thing that we showed from the, I just did a screen. I took my, my camera and took a shot. So if nothing else, let me put this up for a minute. If you wanna get a copy of the resources from Kelly, let me just give you a minute to pull out your phone and take a quick shot of that. I hope that's helpful. And then here's a list of the, the um, more inspiration ones for, for me, if you're interested in having a shot of that.
Good. Just another thing in terms of you coming up with lines of inquiry to kind of guide the conversation along the way to build your simple visuals. And we're gonna talk about different audiences in a minute. Um, these are some of the lines of inquiry that I used with my um, committee that we talked about. And I'll share with you some of the activities we did. Um, but the idea of gathering diverse voices, what, um, what are we hearing from the data that's already been um, collected? And a really important question became, who are we not hearing from? Um, using gap analysis, I'll talk about that and again, but having a broad topic to start with and asking what are our students experiencing? What do we want our students to experience? It, to experience? Um, and allowing space for what students are experiencing to list out the good things, to name the good things. Um, but how is that student experience changing for any, any particular group of our students? Um, we had a line of questioning about value added. What does a student gain if they have to stop out? What have they left if they haven't completed? What value have we added to their life? Um, and then the classic question about COVID, what change that we wanna keep going? And again, what have the impacts of COVID been on different groups? And does that change the way that we move forward into this next space? So I'm gonna talk a little bit more now about our my process in the past year with this, and it's gonna go into the next cycle. But let me just help you think about audiences, right? Especially when you're thinking about these visualizations. We started a conversation with everybody. And that conversation started in the summer of 2020. We had done a lot of COVID surveying, impact surveying of both our students and our employees. And my effort right away was to share that information as soon as we got it. So I started an email series out to the entire campus through that summer semester. I would share key points from the data that we learned. And in the same email, I put in like a suggestion box. There was a survey. We gave broad groups for um, input and we literally asked them those gap analysis questions in the survey and some other questions. So broad topics available for everybody to participate in. We gave data and we asked for input back. And I think that set the tone, right? We're focused on data, we're focused on feedback. And again, we could refer, to the, refer back to that and say everybody had a chance to join this conversation and give input into this conversation. What we collected through those um, gap analysis from those campus-wide suggestions became the um, a significant part of the data source that the committees discussed and that the task forces used to come up with their findings and recommendations. At the committee level, it's a lot more data exercises. You may go into a, um, a deeper level of looking at data and charts and using exercises. And those were very discussion-based. And I feel like it kind of set the tone and the theme, keeping data as important, um, but also keeping sense-making. This was really the center for sense-making and then those committee members then, and this could be your diversity and equity and inclusion team, whatever team you're working with, then moved into teams or task forces. Those task forces had full access to all the data, to the reports that they could get at, um, and they had access to those ready survey responses. So all the new ideas, and they were encouraged to start with the new ideas and find the data relative to those. With those task forces and leading those task forces, what I found worked best was to be very flexible on the process that they used to do their investigation, but to be very clear on what each one's task was and how they were gonna report back. Um, I'm gonna just go a little bit closer here into the, we called it the, the READY survey. That was that initial survey series. READY stands for um, recruit, engage, advise, develop, and instruct. So each week, those were the topics that we shared data on and got input on. Um, it was really about um, faculty and staff contributing their thoughts to each part of being ready for the new learning environment. And that input is what went into strategic enrollment management and into our strategic planning task forces. Um, this next slide is really busy, but I just kind of want to give you a peek um, at the kind of data. Here we go. Um, at the kind of data that we um, got back, which was deep. 
Um, so this is just on the engage part. I don't know if I can, oh, that's as far as I can go. So you can see the question was, what do our new students experience in the first two to four weeks? What do we want new students to experience in the next two to four weeks? Um, and we moved on to, sorry. Um, what new opportunities do we want or students to engage in earlier? How can we get everyone engaged in involving students early? And I guess I could show you again, um, you can see some of the really thoughtful things that came through. Um, faculty learning groups, welcoming environment, inclusive classrooms. I was not asking diversity and equity specific questions. I was asking questions very broadly and these were the voices that came forward for the people who chose to, to share. And I think that that ended up being really important for how clear our um, campus dialogue became on equity inclusion because it came up clearly through the data. So um, now I think we're doing pretty well with time. I'm gonna move through this next part quickly because we're gonna start to get you active and participating. Um, but there are, I promise, three um, active meeting techniques, discussion techniques involving data. And that's what I'm gonna move you through now. And these are the names of the three techniques. And I'm gonna move first into the predict one. Um, fairly simple, right? Um, but what you do is take a data, take a table, take something that is being presented widely, even outside of your organization. This is simply demographic information for our service area. And I whited out, I took out the data points and you can see in each column, there's a place to put that group's prediction for that amount. And I asked them to predict um, the percent in Buncombe County and then either do higher or lower for our second service area um, and gave them an opportunity to do that with each one. And then I gave the actual numbers and doing that conversation allowed people to make their own observations, to put in check their assumptions, and it led to good conversations happening just on a very broad level. I did this predict level exercise with my board of trustees, with our foundation board, with our leadership um, academy on campus, and with my strategic planning committee, just as a way to get everybody warmed up. And so when I came back and presented in October, the strategic plan to the board of trustees, we had set the tone from the beginning that we were using data in significant ways. And so uh, that ended up being a good, good groundwork as well. So predict is an easy tool. Um, and I'm gonna move you next into um, seeing what it feels like. So this is a data set that I did not use. I think I will use it this coming year. I did a first attempt with it. I have in my quest to understand what that difference is between our cohort and our finishing students um, become aware of a metric that I wasn't aware of in the past. And I feel silly for not thinking of it, um, but there are a significant number of our students, first time students who end the term having earned zero credits. No one can agree that that's what we want to happen for our students. Um, they're leaving uh, with a failure. Um, they may be leaving with debt or at least with aid being used that they did not earn something on their transcript for. So this is a problem no matter what group this is for. And so I want you to take a minute right now to think about, um, and I'm gonna share my campus data and I'm gonna believe that it's probably not that much different than everybody else's campus data. Overall, for the entire first time fall group of students, what percentage of our students do you believe ended their first term with zero credits? The whole group. Just jot it down or keep it in your mind. Now make an estimate or a prediction about Hispanic Latinx students. What did that look like for them? Now make a prediction for black students. Now make a prediction for black males. For us and our first time students, it was 12.2% in 2019. 
Um, what I want to help you understand at a school our size, that was several hundred students, people, as Kelly talks about the personal story, that could fill more than a dozen full-time classrooms. So what was it for Hispanic and Latinx students in this particular data set? Fairly similar. What was it for our Black students? And I think all of this, this next point shows really well the danger of averages. And I think a point that Susan was making earlier about digging down deeper and looking at the intersections and groups. Um, when you don't disaggregate things down, you're gonna miss the story. In your deep dives, you have to disaggregate in a lot, a lot of different ways. Because then you can see, you would have, if you hadn't have missed the story that black males um, were 31.3%. So um, in a simple way, one out of 10, two out of 10, and then in a simple way, three times more likely for a black male. Just want I to point out myself on mute and then I forgot to take myself off, of course. So you talked about, you know, how do we, you hadn't thought about you know, the idea of zero credit CERN being a good metric, but it really is. And so in the chat, I put two links to some CCRC reports on early momentum metrics. If you're not familiar with these reports, I would definitely take a look at it. Um, at Central Piedmont, we're not currently using the zero, the zero credits in first term, but we are looking at fall to spring retention, we are looking at um, year one math and English success. And then we're also looking at credits earned first year. And for that, we definitely have to disaggregate it by full-time part-time students. And so we're currently looking at four, measure, four metrics to try and get an some early momentum feeling for how our students are doing. And so these, these reports from CCRC offer you some additional alternatives to consider. Thank you. Yeah, and you don't have to recreate the wheel. Um, and I think for me, as I've dug in the data and used it over, over the years in different retention efforts, the one that ends up being the most powerful, if you had to choose one to go deeply on, it's this idea of credits earned. Um, how many credits did they attempt over their time? And how many did they actually earn? Because a strict return the next near term or return the next fall, this zero credit shows you that they may be returning with much less than they tried for, which we can't call a success. So if they're coming back with less than or not what they attempted, it's a data point, but how many credits have actually moved on to their transcript? How much progress have they made towards their um, academic goal? And that story is much better told in a credit earned percentage, um, or it's a lens that I think is a, a st stronger focus on that. Uh, the next um, tool, active discussion group, and again, I use these largely at the committee level. So with leadership teams, again, with our campus leadership academy, and then my strategic planning committee, we met once a week for about an hour and a half, and I kept these kinds of exercises with data going. It set the culture. It kind of made themes kind of come up for the whole group that they then took into their teamwork, um, into their more specific assignments. So nominating questions, again, these aren't incredibly complicated, but it works really well. So I have done this face-to-face -face and really enjoyed it. And you and I today are gonna struggle through trying to do it online. Um, but you give um, small groups are given one broad focus question. So your compelling question, your compelling data point. Um, and in those small groups, you encourage them to brainstorm. You can remind them of those goals as many questions as possible. So what are the questions? A brainstorm, there's not a stupid question. A whole, people had pages full of questions. And then from there, you move them into an opportunity to say, okay, we're only gonna be able to report out three of these questions from our group. And I think there's some bad things that happen in reporting out where things get lost. 
And this technique really locks you into highlighting or rephrasing three questions that everybody has agreed on. And then those go on a big sheet of paper on the wall. And then people are given dots, right? And they get to go around and vote. So if you had three groups, there's nine questions on there, maybe similar themes that people go around and put dots on. Um, I did different color dots for in the past, one for what we want to discuss today and others that are important for later conversations. Um, and so what happened then for that meeting was the one that had the most dots for what we want to talk about today is where we then moved into what I call circle of voices, a deeper, a deeper discussion. The benefit of that was we still had maybe six to eight very good questions that then set the agenda for later meetings. Um, that this can be used to re-energize a team. You can do this with your leadership team and know what the most important questions are for them and then carry those questions down to your committee discussions or your task force discussions. So it's a communication tool um, and a way of really handing over control for the discussion to the people in the room. So again, starting broad, narrowing down your topic by giving the people that you're in dialogue with um, the ability to prioritize the questions that are emerging, emerging for, for later analysis. Um, so we are gonna have to um, pivot here. And Kelly, do you have the, the three rounds of questions pulled up? I that do. You can, that you can read off. I don't have a, um, I don't have a polling option in, in here as we maybe had anticipated that we did. Um, so I have three rounds of questions and we're just gonna have to, we won't do the brainstorming part as a group. So you need to imagine that these are what's up on the three um, pieces of paper. Um, I wish I'd created backup slides with the questions on them, but you'll just have to listen carefully. Um, so this first one, um, Kelly is gonna read three questions off slowly. And we'll just use, if you're able to, to raise your hand, we'll just kind of get a sense of for each round, which question ended up being the most important to you to discuss today. Okay, um, so I also put the questions in the chat box so you can brilliant. read them as I state them. So in round one, we have three, four questions and which question, you know, speaks most to you? Do students who earn zero credits come back? What is their experience? What is the trend over time for each group? What policies and procedures impact these students? So again, we set the focus with the predict exercise on zero credits. Now we're moving into prioritizing what that brought up for us. And then of these three questions, which one seems most important to discuss today? Okay. Um, Brianne so, votes for what is their experience? Laura, and I hope I got your name right. I apologize if I didn't. Uh, Lori says, do they come back? Why don't we know, do, can we do a raise their hands for each question? Sure. Okay. Okay. So if you look at your Zoom, you should have reactions on the bottom right hand side, hopefully. And if you click on reactions, one of them is to raise your hand. So when you hear the question you want to vote for, raise your hand. Do students who earn zero credits come back here? Raise your hands. Okay, and those hands should come down of their own accord, I think. Next question option, what is their, the student's experience? Okay, I think we have a feel. What is the trend over time for each group? I don't know, Anne, we're getting pretty consistent responses here. Yep. And what policies and procedures affect these students? Okay. 
Good. And again, these are things that you want to talk about today. So Kelly, can we do round two? Sure. So what do you think the prevailing question was in round one, Anne? We had um, two of them had four. So do they come back and uh, what's their experience? And then what's the trend over time? Okay. So looking at round two, who on campus knows who the students that are earning zero credits are? What, do, what, are, what is the literature or best practices for preventing first-time students from earning zero credits? What work and life factors contribute to students earning zero credits in their first term? So just again, real quick, who on campus knows these students? What does the literature tell us? And what are the work and laugh factors that contribute to these students earning zero credits? Good, so I'll name them just one at a time and, and you can raise your hand after each one. So who knows who these students are? Go ahead and raise a hand. If you think it's valuable to discuss today? Okay, um, literature, what does the literature say? And then life factors. I think life factors is far and away the compelling the question. Okay, let's move through the third round, but we may have found what we're talking about. Okay, go ahead, Kelly. Okay, round three. Is there any way to predict who, which students are most likely to have this outcome? What is the instructor's role in preventing student in preventing this outcome? What are the educational goals of students who earn zero credits in their first term? So is there any way to predict who is most likely to earn zero credits? What can instructors do to prevent this from happening? And what are the educational goals of these students? Okay, so let's vote. The ability to predict who would like to discuss that? Okay. What's the instructor's role? And then what were these students' educational goals? Nice, and that one ended up being important too. Well, I think that that is an interesting kind of heat heat map of what is important to the group after they've considered that. So um, what, what we're gonna go ahead with, and Kelly, if you wanna read the full question again and put the final question in the chat, but it's the one related to work and life factors. Okay, so from round two, and this was far and ahead the most votes. What work and life factors contribute to students earning zero credits in their first term. So again, um, what this can do, you have something to talk about right away of substance. You also can create different task forces based on the other questions that seemed important to the group. You can use it to re-energize re an existing group or it can simply become the beginning agenda point for future meetings, the, high, the prioritized questions. Um, so the last discussion um, technique or data kind of discussion technique that I wanna share with you is my absolute bread and butter um, and the one that I recommend the most, but also takes the most time. It's called Circle of Voices. And again, on my um, resource slide, that 50 ways to start a good discussion, um, but what Circle of Voices do, I'll describe what it is in a minute, but the purpose is it's a structured conversation, discussion that ensures each person has the opportunity to participate. It, it minimizes opportunities for one voice to dominate and it, provide time, it provides time for a focus to emerge and not to be forced. And, um, and, and I'm gonna interrupt just real quick and make sure everyone knows that 
Ken provided a link, to, a Google link to the resources that we are offering from the presentation. And that includes handouts and the slide deck. Great. All right, so here are the instructions. Again, I think this is something you can internalize and it's pretty doable for, for anyone right away. Um, and you, you provide a focus. So we have a focus question. You could have done a predict exercise. You could have done a mini presentation on a new data point or a new report. Had that really good visual, maybe the one with the pictures of the different students, something broad um, that can focus the conversation. Then the next point, and probably I would say the most important one and often rushed through, is that everybody is given two to three minutes of silence before the next part goes on. Sometimes that feels like a very long time, um, but people get time on their own. Um, and what that does, people who are slower to process have the time to um, get somewhere meaningful for them to an observation. Um, people who may be faster processors can get a lot of ideas down, but then they have time to prioritize which one is important for the next phase of the discussion. So it takes in some of that mental processing, it takes in some of that personality style. Um, and so that silent step to me is very important. The next step is really where democracy happens. Each person is given the opportunity to share for one uninterrupted moment an observation that they made related to the topic. So again, it's important, and as I've done this, it's important to emphasize more than once, you have the opportunity to contribute to the circle of voices. When it becomes your turn, you can say pass, come back to me, or you can say no, thank you. But the idea, the democracy of it all is that everyone has an opportunity to participate. I have very few people who choose not to participate if they're guaranteed one minute to share something that they've thought about and know that they won't be interrupted. And then from there, once you've had that conversation, again, that takes a while. If you have a room of 15 people, you have to allow 15 minutes for that. Um, and then you can have an open conversation. And the only kind of structure for that open conversation is to say as much as possible, please refer back to something that was shared in the previous round. So try again to maintain focus on the topic and on what's important to that particular group of people. Um, so this is where we are right now. We've done our predict exercise. We've done our um, nominating questions exercise. We've selected our one question. Just, I'm gonna give you, um, I have a timer. I'm gonna give you one minute um, to do your silent portion. So we are thinking about, hopefully it can go up in the chat again, but work, what are the work-life factors that are contributing to students earning zero credits in their first term? You have a minute. Shannon, do you have a question? That was a minute. Um, I hope you all feel a little maybe calmer and, um, and centered to move into this next part and to be in a space to listen, but also have one idea that you'd like to share. We have about 15 minutes left in our session, so I'm going to ask you to share even quicker um, than, than one minute. So as quickly as you can, um, just name one life factor that you think is important. So we're going to use it more, more like a poll. Um, I'm going to call out your name. Please Unmute yourself. We'd like to hear your voice in this circle. So if you'd be ready to unmute yourself, um, you don't know the order that you're on on my screen, so I'll, I'll give time. Um, but if you don't mind, um, Jane Scott, you now have the opportunity to pass, decline, 
or to share one factor? My thought is that they have um, work obligations. Yeah, good. Brian Epstein, how about you? Kelly Smith, how about you? Oh, I didn't know we were a part of it. Um, I think work obligations is a is very important. Yeah. Ken, how about you, Engel? I would say work obligations as well. Okay. Please forgive me if I'm wrong. Axana Smithheart. It's Shiana. Sorry. <laughs> Childcare costs. Yes. Um, C. Shannon Brown. Child care or elder care? Yeah. Carla Moore. I was thinking child care as well, mm -hmm. the lack of it. Brianne? I would say lack of time due to all these obligations. Yeah. Bermesia? Please forgive me. That's perfectly correct. Huh. Um, family obligations. Yep. Medjatu. Um, family obligations and possibly a lack of support. Yeah. Una. Um, maybe a lack of a sense of belonging. Hmm. Christina. I can see you're unmuted and I can't hear you. Christina, if you're having problems, just throw it in chat. There you go. Susanna? Uh, in my world, I would say any COVID related um, uh, illnesses or other health related issues. Yeah. Betty? Beverly? Hi, I would say maybe um, I'll add in the pile a, uh, a lower readiness level of how to do college and therefore uh, I think you got muted again or maybe maybe broke up. Is there another thought to share? Or are you good for now? Hey, I'm sorry. I am in my car, so I might have lost you for a second. I was just saying uh, perhaps a, a different level of, of readiness on how to do college. And uh, along with that, the idea of being overwhelmed. Nice. Rebecca, would you like to join the conversation? I would say apprehensions about the campus environment or how they would be treated or have been treated. Mm -hmm. Lori. Hi, I think most of them have been covered. I mean, this would be pandemic related, but I would just say lack of focus, but because of the stress, um, thinking the uncertainty of things. Yeah, yeah, good. Now here's my opportunity. Did I miss anyone? Um, or did someone who um, passed wanted to go ahead and, and share a thought now? Well, I was thinking about loss of income from, you know, um, in for some families, you would have situations where both parents lost their jobs and they have to they have to now assume that responsibility to go out and find employment yeah yeah good well that closes the sharepoint where everybody's been able to have space to to give an initial thought i really appreciate everybody sharing their thought and um and contributing to the conversation in that way and so now we're going to move into an open conversation and you're welcome to speak as often as you like 
um, at any point that you like. We just ask that people speak one at a time. If you'd like to raise your hand, I'd be happy to help make the transition between different conversations. And that can also help you see who else is wanting to make a contribution. Um, and again, as much as possible, I think we did get that kind of heat map. Some things came up more than once, which help us kind of understand where the group is in terms of what's important in the zero credit and first term conversation. So now I'm simply gonna hand the floor to you as a group. One thing I think our list points out is that it's probably not just one, one barrier that our students, just like ourselves, are facing multiple challenges and is going to probably take multiple supports to help them overcome the challenges they're facing. We did a good bit of surveying um, around worries during the COVID, COVID time. I imagine all of you did too. The number one worry was having to deal with online classes um, for them. And then mental health um, ended up, which is all related to the, to the different things that, that came up there. Um, Carla, right? go ahead. I know we mentioned a lot of things, but some resource things could be an issue as well. Maybe there's like a lack of transportation or if you're taking online courses, um, internet access, that kind of thing. And maybe there are some things that the institution could do to help with those things. You know, something we struggle with is that we have comprehensive resources available almost to the fact that it's hard to know how to access them. going to switch gears again, if you don't mind, is there a final thought on um, on the discussion that we kind of began or practiced leading people through? You have a final thought on zero credit. Just have a couple minutes. I would appreciate to go around the room one more time out of the three active discussion. Well, out of the three active discussion techniques or really anything from the presentation in terms of data sharing or things like that. If you're willing to, you will have the opportunity to share one, one takeaway. So let me go around the room. Um, you can share one, I'll give a pause. Um, you can share one takeaway, feel free to pass um, or to say no, or come back to me or to say no thanks. So let me just give you a quick, a minute to think. Ken, would you like to share? Oh, thank you. Uh, I, overall, I just uh, an incredible wealth of information and things to take away and how we can further engage our college community and, and the use of data and make it more accessible and understandable, especially around topics of equity. So I, I just appreciate all of it. I hope I'm a good learner. Shiana. My takeaway um, emphasizes the important work and role of institutional effectiveness and people in, in our position um, and the importance or, or our role in, in disseminating this information and educating people um, within our institutions. Yeah, beyond just providing the reports, how can we support decision-making, sense-making? Yeah, Shannon? Just to thank you for the presentation. Okay, Carla?
I really liked the predict piece. That's not something I had done. So that was a big one for me. Good. Brianne? I enjoyed the discussions, but um, the big takeaway I'd say is that um, the visuals are important to making presentations stronger and more effective. Promethea? I want to say thank you for the presentation. Um, I mentioned I was working on a proposal for us to rebuild our um, dashboards and the importance of disaggregating the data to make it meaningful, where we can tell a story and identify problems is my biggest takeaway because a lot of our dashboards are so high level. It's just head count. Yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna say the name right. I'm not sure I did it, Majuta. I'm sorry. It's Majatu. Thank you. Very close. You actually said it right the first time. Oh. Um, I think it's to kind of echo, I think it's Bermisha, what she said about just making or creating more compelling and more meaningful visualizations. Um, a lot of the work that I'm doing right now um, within my agency is just trying to make use and easily communicate all this data that has been gathered for so many years in a way and present it in a way that, you know, leadership and my coworkers are able to just be able to pick out some key points from the data. So without me having to go through a five minute rambling session. So I really appreciated um, that portion of the workshop. So just going through and kind of giving pointers on how to enhance um, the information that you're presenting in a, in a succinct way. Good luck to you, thank you. Christina? My big takeaway is I have a lot to do. <laughs> <laughs> Honesty, Una? Oh, did you have more? I'm sorry. No, it just, we are, uh, data visualization is high level. So getting it down and with program review, service reviews, start thinking about disaggregating, not just race and ethnicity, but also race by ethnicity or, or uh, I mean, gender by ethnicity and stuff. So yeah, I have a lot of work to do. <laughs> <laughs> Una, what are you thinking about? Um, well, yeah, I, I, you know, I appreciate all the other comments and, and this, this, yeah, really great presentation, really thought provoking. Um, and I, I really liked uh, what you talked about, about making a story, uh, thinking about what you really want to communicate there instead of just like throwing tons of data at people and also focusing on the positive side, which I really liked. Uh, you said we have a representative set of students coming to our institution. Now, wh how are we failing them? Because they're not getting to point B. Um, and looking more at the aspirations of our students and less at that, just the performance didn't work out for these particular demographics. And so I really think looking at it in more of that asset framing manner is, is a much more positive way to do that. And I do think you have to focus on specific populations. I, I know there's always the talk about raising all boats or, you know, uh, but, but in fact, there are specific issues that need to be worked on by popular by specific populations and so it, i think it does t you do need to focus and not just present all the data all the time so thank you for a very thought-provoking session you're welcome and i don't want to make anybody late to another session there is no judgment if you have to jump off because you're getting to the next thing we have a couple more people who i would if, give the opportunity to make a quick share so jane And things are shifting on me, so I'm not sure I'm getting everyone. Beverly, you still driving? Oh, Jane, I see you. Hey, actually, I'm, I'm here now, so I'm not driving anymore. <laughs> um, thank you, first of all, for the session. And thank you for 
Um, thank you for the focus of your equity lens and looking at this material. I think um, sometimes I am not in IR, but I work very closely with IR. I am in our equity and inclusion area at my college and uh, we present a lot of data and um, IR, IR department is so amazing. Um, but I loved your um, ideas about even something simple like taking uh, a graph or a chart that you're going to be using and adding those extra layers in there of, you know, those, um, you know, just those extra pieces that we could layer on top of that to make it more meaningful. And I also really appreciated the uh, conversational piece of the, the dialogue. Um, I love the idea of giving people a minute to collect their thoughts and then to be able to share. Um, I am a processor, and so I definitely appreciate that time. Um, and I know a lot of other people that do. And uh, I, I just love the idea that, uh, again, not being a data person, even though I have worked with it for a while now, um, I appreciate the idea of taking something that to some people can seem kind of dry, you know, um, and to take that and to really use it to make it into something really meaningful to them um, through that visual aspect and then through the conversational piece. So 